Thank you so much for that introduction, Nicole. And just to let everyone know, please feel free to call me Julie um, <laughs> going forward. That's completely fine with me. All right, so just to give a little bit of background about uh, machine learning is how I'm going to start this talk. And then I'm going to talk about the two applications um, that were kind of my first introduction, honestly, to, to these two particular approaches with supervised and unsupervised machine learning. And then I'll finish us out with some closing thoughts on applying machine learning to epidemiologic research. Um, and one caveat I'll give is I really aimed for this talk to not be too highly technical. Um, I wanted to try to reach as broad of an audience as possible. So if you do have a lot of background in machine learning, I apologize. You'll probably actually think this talk is somewhat simplistic, but hopefully you'll get something out of it too. Um, so as some background, so I personally believe that the ultimate goal of epidemiologic research is to identify modifiable agents in order to prevent adverse health outcomes in the future. And often as epidemiologists, we're relying on observational data because randomized trials are unethical for a particular exposure that we're interested in. Um, as Nicole mentioned, most of my work has centered around perinatal health. And so I was interested in studying the effects of tobacco exposure and alcohol. It wouldn't get past the IRB for me to randomize women to those particular exposures. Also, certain exposures we may be interested in, it may be infeasible to randomize individuals to things like genetics or pre existing conditions or BMI. And also certain exposures, it just may be too resource intensive for us to get funding to do a particular randomized study, even if in theory it's possible. So if we were interested, let's say, um, in looking at the influence of certain vitamin supplements on um, prevention of birth defects, um, which a lot of my research has been in birth defects, um, those outcomes are extremely rare, so it may be really, really hard for us to get funding to do a randomized trial where we're looking at those outcomes just because we need an enormous amount of individuals to enroll in the trial. And even if we could get the funding to do it, we may find that um, individuals that end up enrolling in those studies may be a more selected group of individuals and those findings that are not generalizable to the broader public that we would ideally like to translate the findings to. So that leaves us often with dealing with observational data and causal inference, as many of you are likely aware, is just really challenging often with observational data. We're often dealing with a lot of variables with really complex relationships between them, which we don't fully understand. Yeah. Other, otherwise, we probably wouldn't be doing this research to begin with. So that takes us to today's topic. Can this magical thing called machine learning somehow make our lives as epidemiologists easier? So what exactly is machine learning? Well, it's the application of statistical algorithms to identify patterns in data that we've collected. It tries to learn from those data and then make decisions such as predictions of, for future outcomes with minimal involvement from the analyst or the analytic team. And I'll just say that many machine learning algorithms that are being used today have been around actually for quite a long time but the ability to automate the processes and analyze these high dimensional data sets is becoming increasingly possible due to increases in computing power and also just the availability of such large data sets in recent years. So there are two types of um, machine learning that I'm gonna focus on today. Um, the first is supervised learning, which I think is a little bit easier for most folks to kind of wrap their head around because it's very similar to approaches that we typically take when we're doing etiologic research. So um, the goal for supervised learning is to predict or classify a particular outcome, which in the machine learning literature is often referred to as a response from a set of predictors. Um, these are often referred to as inputs or features of the data. So, um, you know, taking a step back and thinking of other applications, it's like we have our dependent variable Y and we're regressing it on a number of independent variables such as X1, X2, et cetera. 
So this is in contrast to unsupervised learning, which is a little bit different from what we're often utilizing, which is where we're trying to identify patterns between our variables in the data. We're not necessarily calling out a particular outcome. We're just looking at all of the variables at hand. And we're trying to classify the data into subgroups that seem to share similar characteristics or may represent complex combinations of the data, but in fewer or simpler terms than utilizing all of the variables, like a, a dimension reduction approach. So things like PCA analysis and cluster analysis are examples of unsupervised learning algorithms. So that takes me to the two applications I'm going to talk to today. Um, the first one is an application of tree-based supervised learning to identify potential risk factors for a birth defect called gastroschisis. So this birth defect is a congenital malformation of the abdomen wall, and it affects roughly 1,900 pregnancies in the U.S. each year. So it, it's a fairly rare outcome, but still very serious in nature. Um, and here I'm showing data from the CDC that were collected between um, 1995 and 2012. And they highlight a really interesting aspect of this particular birth defect. Um, so each one of these lines represents a different age group of the mothers that gave birth during these time frames, with this um, top solid blue line representing mothers that were less than 20 years old. And here we're showing the prevalence of gastroschisis over that time period. So you can see there was quite a stark increase among young, younger mothers experiencing these outcomes. We see in the next line, mothers that were 20 to 24 years, where we're still seeing an increase, but not quite as sharp. And then much less of an increase occurred among the older mothers um, in the US. So this brings us to the rationale and objective for this particular study. So um, these time trends and age differences are quite curious. And while some risk factors have been identified, such as low BMI, the multitude of studies that have been done in gastrocesis still don't seem to fully explain um, these trends that have been occurring. So our aim for the analysis was to uh, see if we can um, get more from the data that we have at hand using tree-based machine learning to identify some new risk factors for this birth defect. And our rationale for using machine learning in part was that we had so many potential predictors available in the data that usually we'd run into model convergence issues using conventional regression approaches. And we also had some um, highly collinear variables, particularly with maternal age. And random forests can be um, particularly good for situations where there may be interaction at play. And we theorize that that might be the case since we are seeing these differences in the time trends um, by maternal age. So for this study, we utilized case control data from the Sloan Epidemiology Center birth defect study, which ascertained information on pregnancies occurring between 1998 and 2015 across several centers in the US and also Canada. Um, for the analysis, we ultimately included 273 cases that were isolated, meaning they were only affected by gastroschisis and not another type of birth defect. And the analysis also had 2,591 controls, and these were non-malformed, live-born infants born at the same centers as the cases. Um, the way the data were collected for this study was through telephone interviews in English or Spanish with the mothers of the cases and controls within six months of the delivery. And for our particular analysis, um, we ended up frequency matching the controls to the cases based on their center because the ratio of case to control ascertainment did end up differing um, by center just through the design of the study. Um, and it was really more of an artifact of the study design that um, center was a strong predictor of case versus control status, but it isn't really a risk factor for gastroschisis. And we didn't want it to um, show up um, that way in the results. So in the end, we included 30 predictors in our random forest models. Um, this included a variety of sociodemographic factors on the mother and the father, um, also several um, health behaviors and characteristics from the, from the mother, and several reproductive and pregnancy factors. 
Um, and one thing I'll highlight for the medications and the food and nutrient variables. So we actually had a much larger set of variables that we initially considered for these. Um, but in order to um, try to uh, reduce down the data a little bit for our random forest models, we initially um, looked at these values and notably for the medications, some of the medications we were initially interested in just occurred at such a rare frequency that it would be really hard to pick up a signal in terms of its relationship with the outcome. Um, and also anything that we found just since the numbers were so small, we were nervous it might just be due to um, the data set at hand and random noise. So um, we did require that some of these had to occur at a certain degree of frequency in order for us to include them. And then for the food items and nutrients, uh, we initially created um, bivariate accrued bivariate associations with these items in order for us to weed out ones that appeared to have absolutely no association with the outcome. So that greatly helped us to reduce down our food and nutrient list. Um, however, we did kind of go back and include some of those original data and sensitivity analyses just to see if it made much of a difference, which it didn't end up doing so. Okay, so for random forests, um, I'd like to give some kind of background information for you to tell to understand what the algorithm is doing. So random forest is a classification tree approach. So I'm going to walk through just a simple classification tree example. Um, and it might be a little bit easier to conceptualize it as a tree if I actually flip this tree picture upside down. So we have our kind of initial trunk and then we have branches coming off of that. Um, so for this example, um, the algorithm initially identifies age as the most important um, distinguisher between case and control status in our data. So it creates a split in the data based on age with age less than 21 years and maternal age at 21 years or more. And then if we follow down this split among participants that were less than 21, it then identifies BMI as the next most important predictor among that group. And it splits the data at less than 25 and greater than or equal to 25 for the BMI. For women that had the lower BMI, the next most important variable it identifies is fast food, splitting it at um, a level of daily intake versus less than daily intake. And so in the end, you can see if you continue to follow down this path of the younger mothers with lower BMIs and daily fast food, you get a certain number of participants. I apologize, some of my um, screen sharing is covering it up so I can't see it, but you can see how many participants are in there. And I think it's around 22-ish percent that had the outcome among that particular group of individuals. So a fairly high proportion of cases. Whereas if you follow down in the classification tree, those that were still younger, but had the higher BMIs, among this group, I think it's about 700, only 4% of them were cases. So you can see through this approach, you can um, ascertain how different risk factors may come together to um, result in higher probabilities of the outcomes, whereas other groups have a much lower probability of the outcome. So what Random Forest is doing is recreating these single classification trees over and over and over again. And the analyst, when before you run your code, will initially tell it um, how many trees you want your forest to be made of. So for this analysis, we used a thousand trees. Um, another thing is that with random forests, so when I described it, I kind of made it sound like you have all of the vari variables available to you in the classification trees, choosing the most important variable among all of the variables that are available. However, for random forests, it actually will um, just choose among a subsample of variables, which one among that subgroup seems most important. Um, so it's going to randomly sample a certain number of variables at each node, and then among that random sampling of variables, it will select which one is the most important. Um, so you, as the analyst, would tell the algorithm how many variables you wanted to sample at each node in order to determine um, which one to use as the split. 
Um, so for us, we said, let's use five variables to be sampled at each node. And then the last main parameter is um, the number of observations that are required in order for a split to be created. So here we specified there had to be at least 20 observations. And the goal of this would be to try to prevent these terminal nodes here at the bottom from getting to be really, really small groups. Um, like you wouldn't want maybe a terminal node of only one person, because that's not really telling you that much about the sample as a whole. Um, so uh, that's the final most important piece that you put into the random forest algorithm. And then for um, our application, we also applied an internal cross-validation approach using out-of-tree bags. And in simplistic terms, what this means is that each time a classification tree is being created, the algorithm will exclude kind of a random subset of participants from that um, tree being created so that each tree is being created on a slightly different set of individuals. And this process is done so that you're not overfitting the algorithm to the entire data set that's at hand, and rather it's being created on slightly different um, analytic samples each time and then summarized across all of them. So this is an approach that can be used in contrast to something like having um, one test data set and then another validation data set that's like a totally different set of individuals and you're, you could see how they compare. That would be an alternative approach. Um, so the main outcome metric that is often obtained from random forest models is a variable importance measure. And there are quite a few variable importance measures that are available. Um, for this analysis, we utilized a permutation-based uh, metric uh, drawing upon the area under the curve value. So um, what this variable importance measure is going to show us is um, so from our random forest, we will get an AUC curve that will um, indicate, you know, how well the model is doing in terms of prediction with the trade-off of sensitivity versus specificity. Um, and then the um, permutation-based variable importance measure will be, let's say we take a given predictor that we include in our random forest model, and we randomly permutate the values. So now they're just essentially random values that are noise that are no longer going to be associated with that outcome. It will then re-estimate the AUC curve and what it looks like with that given variable now just being a random variable and no longer associated with the outcome. So a variable that's important in terms of determining the AUC value for the original curve that we have we would expect that once it's randomly permutated like that, the AUC curve should decrease quite a bit, right? Because it's like really important for the overall prediction in the model. And in contrast, a variable that's already kind of more of a random noise variable and not very associated with the outcome, we would expect it to have pretty minimal or no influence on the AUC value that we originally observed. Um, so um, what this variable importance measure will do is essentially rank the variables based on how much the AUC curve changes as we do that random permutation. Um, and then to take a step back, um, we wanted to also just utilize some more conventional um, statistics. Um, and so using logistic regression um, for each variable that was identified as important based on the random forest models, we estimated odds ratios and 95% confidence intervals to look at what the magnitude of those associations look like. So now into the results. So for our random forest model, we had a rather high AUC value of 0.86. So looking pretty good for prediction. Um, for our variable importance plot, uh, this shows it with all of the variables that we included. However, I'm gonna focus in on the top 10 to make it a little bit easier for all of us to see. Um, so here at the bottom of the figure, we see our variable importance value. And here are the list of the top 10 most important predictors. Um, and the variable importance measures are often very hard to interpret in terms of an actual 
numeric value that's seen here. So often it's just interpreted in terms of the relative distance between one variable to the next. Um, so here we can see young parents is by far the most important predictor in the model. And I can say from having run it, if we had separated out, you know, young moms versus young dads, then those would definitely be driving these associations quite a bit because those the young maternal age is by far the most important predictor. Um, the next most important variable is whether or not the parents were together in a relationship, then um, lower parent education, low maternal BMI, parity of one or less for the study pregnancy, um, being a current smoker, low family income, unplanned pregnancy, frequency of fast food intake, and marijuana use um, around the time of conception or early pregnancy. Then looking at our odds ratio associations, um, so we ran both crude models that just looked at um, the individual uh, independent variables in relation to um, case control status. And then we also ran an adjusted model that simultaneously controlled for all of these things at once, probably in practice, if we were interested in focusing in on one of these specific things, we would end up controlling for a slightly different set of variables. But um, for simplicity, we did control for all of these things in the same model shown as the AOR here. So looking at the Adjusted odds ratio, um, not too surprisingly, we saw that um, young paternal age and uh, lower BMI had the strongest associations in these data. And these odds ratios are quite strong with parent, parent age combined, representing an odds ratio of 6.6 .6 and um, underweight versus those with obesity, an odds ratio of 4.3. Um, several variables um, in the, these data are going to be highly correlated with young paternal age, and so not surprisingly, these associations attended quite a bit in our adjusted models, even to the null for income and unplanned pregnancy. However, given that they showed up in the random forest model, it may suggest that um, they are actually important and they may be an important um, variable in terms of their interaction with some of these other variables which we didn't include any interaction terms in these adjusted models. Um, and then lastly, I know it's pretty light in the slides, but the most novel findings of this work were um, this noting that daily fast food intake and also marijuana use um, appeared to be associated with an increased risk of gastroschisis. And so um, these are areas that we're, um, we would like to look into more in the future to dive into that a little bit deeper. Okay, next I'm going to talk about the second study, which um, is an application of unsupervised learning to identify subgroups of placental features and then study the associations between those groups of placental data in relation to adverse outcomes of pregnancy. So um, I imagine some of you on this call are um, familiar with this amazing organ, the placenta, that develops specifically for pregnancy. Um, it is the prime, its primary role is the exchange um, between the mother and the developing fetus during pregnancy. And so not too surprisingly, it's hypothesized that it plays a key role in the mediation and development of um, adverse outcomes of pregnancy. It's suspected that it's the primary cause of interuterine growth restriction. So these are babies that as they're going on in their development, don't seem to be reaching their full growth potential. And it also may account for up to 60% of stillbirths of thought. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the etiologic research in relation to the role of the placenta in pregnancy has been fairly limited in part because we're often drawing upon um, clinical databases for these analyses. So um, in essence, looking at medical records and what is available on the placenta in those um, sources. And in clinical practice, usually the placenta is only sent on for a very thorough um, pathological examination if a problem is suspected during the pregnancy or delivery or immediately thereafter. 
And so using just medical records in order to do these studies can be a bit problematic because we don't usually have that many um, uncomplicated pregnancies included in the sample to serve as a reference group. So that brings us to um, the objective of this next study. So in this sample, um, unlike those studies that tend to draw from clinical databases, here we had placentas that were um, not selected based on the outcome, which was a unique aspect of the study. Um, and so we aim to investigate associations between co-occurring placental features and adverse outcomes of pregnancy. Now, our rationale for using machine learning um, came from a few places. So um, first, we still had those problems that I mentioned before, where we had you know, many uh, features, actually over 50 features available on each placenta, um, which are really more predictors than we could easily include in conventional regression models. Definitely here, some of those features were strongly correlated with one another. And some of the outcomes that we were interested in looking at, like stillbirth and preeclampsia, are rare. Um, so um, that was a problem with using conventional regression. And also, um, we were really interested in the co-occurrence of features as opposed to studying the role of each individual feature in relation to the outcome. Um, so individual placental features have been described in some overarching categories like vascular malperfusion, but there really isn't a universally accepted clinical definition for precise groupings of co-occurring features. Um, so we felt that uh, a statistically based approach for data reduction, here specifically we use cluster analysis, seemed appropriate in order to identify some underlying groupings that seem to have common placental features and may um, represent um, different etiologies that are occurring. So um, for our study, we utilized data from the Safe Passage study, which was a prospective pregnancy cohort. Um, this study enrolled women during their pregnancy at the, in, um, the North and South Dakota in the US and also the Western Cape in South Africa between 2007 and 2015. And these women were followed through their pregnancy, the delivery, and then the child's first year. Um, and through the study, um, there were up to four in-person visits occurring during the pregnancy, during which a number of standardized questionnaires were collected. And also there were medical record abstractions conducted to obtain information on medical history, um, complications of the pregnancy and the delivery. Um, and you might find these two uh, populations that were targeted to be kind of an interesting pair to group together. And so I will um, say that the study was originally designed to study um, the effects of prenatal alcohol and tobacco exposure on risks of stillbirth and sudden infant death syndrome. Um, and so um, these two groups in particular were focused because uh, they tend to have historically higher rates of these particular exposures and these outcomes, um, which may translate to some generalizability issues for our study findings. Um, of note, um, it's, it's definitely possible that we'll have a higher occurrence of some uh, placental problems and adverse outcomes with this sample, just that because they tend to be a higher risk group. Um, so for our study design, um, how the placentas were um, flagged for collection. So roughly a third of participants that were enrolled prior to 24 weeks gestation were randomly invited to participate in some additional study elements, which included placental collection. So this is truly the novelty of this particular data set, where we're expecting to have a fairly large number of uncomplicated pregnancies that were selected prior to the onset of pregnancy complications and the, knowing the delivery outcome. So to be eligible for the analysis, the pregnancy needed to result in a live born or stillborn singleton between 20 and 40 weeks gestation, and they had to be initially enrolled in the embedded study with the placenta collected. And so ultimately, we had 2,005 participants that were included in this analysis. So for the placental pathology, um, for the study, it was conducted by study pathologists using a standardized protocol that was utilized at all of the different sites. 
Um, so again, this is actually another fairly unique aspect of this study. So the pathology was not done um, as part of clinical practice. There were placentas in this sample that were analyzed for clinical practice, but this examination was done separately from that according to a protocol that was the same at all of the sites. And they also utilized all of the same data collection forms so that they all captured exactly the same information on over 50 features, um, macro and microscopic of the placenta. And these included things like um, the size of the placenta, whether or not there were infarctions present, um, signs of retroplacental hemorrhage. So this would be bleeding occurring because the placenta is tearing away from the uterine wall during abruption as well as several other features of the pregnancy. Um, for our adverse outcomes, um, there were four primary areas we were interested in looking at. So this was preterm birth, stillbirth, preeclampsia, and also um, whether or not the baby was small at the time of delivery based on um, their birth weight, which we um, defined as a small for gestational age birth, and also small head circumference. So in order for us to determine um, the clusters of the placental data, we ultimately decided to use hierarchical clustering. So um, of the, our main reason for this was that this particular approach doesn't require pre-specification of the number of groups that one expects to see in the data. So that's in contrast to something like k-means clustering, where you initially tell um, the algorithm to specifically look for, let's say, two groups in the data. So using the hierarchical approach, the observations are subdivided into a visual called a dendogram, which is shown here in this example. So just to conceptually understand kind of how one would maybe interpret this, depending on the number of clusters that you choose. So for this first visual, um, there's only one cluster because if you look down at the bottom of the dendogram, each one of these lines represents a different observation in the data. And since they're all colored in green, we're saying that there's only one cluster in these data. Now, if we look at the dendogram again and now cut it at this first split in the data, we're now identifying two clusters, um, one represented by this branch in pink and a second one identified down here in green. And then if we go to the third example of the dendogram, we're now cutting it the next level down where that second cluster was subdivided into two um, clusters. So now we have three clusters. We have our pink original cluster, we have a new yellow cluster, and then we have this green subset cluster. Um, so the reason this approach is called hierarchical clustering is because as you continue to go down in the dendogram, each time you have a new uh, additional cluster, um, it's because one of the prior clusters has now been subdivided. So each cluster grouping is necessarily nested within a higher level. Um, so when you're using clustering approaches, the main way that the algorithm is going to end up deciding how to group observations together will be based on the linkage and the distance metric. Um, so for this particular data set, all of our characteristics ended up being coded as binary. Even ones that had additional levels, we ended up creating indicator variables. So all the variables were zero or one. And these two approaches are um, kind of the most common ones when you're dealing with binary data. So with Ward's D linkage, it will initially um, say that all observations belong to their own clusters. So if we go back to the dendogram, it would be like, every single one of these lines representing a different observation, each one is a different color because everyone's in their own cluster. And then Wards D will select which pair of observations to merge together based on whichever merger results in the minimum increase in the error sum of squares based on the distance metric that you choose. Um, so here we use Jakar and um, to give a simplistic example with Jakar approach, um, if you have two observations, let's call them person A and person B, and each one of them has n number of binary characteristics, the Jacquard coefficient will be the measure of overlap that person A and person B share among that set of characteristics. 
um, represented down here by the M sub one one. Um, so, um, so that's how the dendrogram is initially formed. And then in terms of the analysis, how one ends up deciding how many clusters they may want to use, um, there are some uh, statistical tests that can be performed, like the elbow or silhouette method, which I won't talk about in detail now for the sake of time, but we did look at those. Um, we also considered how small some of the clusters would end up getting as we continued to go further down, um, because we didn't want the clusters to get so small that it would be really hard to say anything about their relationship with the pregnancy outcomes at hand, um, which is tricky because some of these outcomes are fairly rare. So we kept those things in mind when we ultimately selected the number of clusters we'd use for the analysis. Um, so once we had identified the placental clusters, um, we looked at associations between those groupings and adverse pregnancy outcomes by computing uh, crude and adjusted risk ratios and confidence intervals. And our adjusted models controlled for measured common risk factors of placental insufficiency and adverse outcomes of pregnancy in order for us to see if um, the association seemed to attenuate, which would suggest that for that particular outcome, we seem to have a pretty good grasp on um, what's causing these uh, placental problems to occur. So these included things like maternal age, nulliparity, BMI, cigarette and alcohol use, and also we use self-reported racial group. And I'll just say, um, we didn't include racial group um, as a, a biological variable, but rather as a very rough proxy for differences in environmental and structural risk factors experienced by these groups, including racism. Um, so here is the dendrogram of the placental clusters that were obtained in our data. I'll mention that these labels that are in put on the figure are ones that we put on um, in order to make the figure a little bit more digestible. And these were determined by looking at the placental features that were most common among these groups um, in order to provide a way to make them more easily interpreted. Um, they're not perfect, but um, they're the best that we could do um, because the clustering algorithm, if you run these, it will only assign numbers to the groups, which is really hard you know, for translational purposes. Um, so here, um, for the initial split in the data, the algorithm appeared to identify a group of fairly normal placentas versus ones that seemed to have more abnormalities present. Then the next split occurred among the abnormal placentas, those that had more signs of inflammation in contrast to those that had more problems with vascular malperfusion. Um, then among the inflammation grouping, it was subdivided into two clusters, which Based on the features present, we didn't have a very good individual label, so we just identified them as inflammation one and inflammation two. And then among the vascular malperfusion cluster, that was subdivided into three clusters. We have a fetal vascular malperfusion cluster, a severe maternal vascular malperfusion cluster, and an other vascular malperfusion cluster. Um, and then lastly, under our normal cluster, those were subdivided into a fairly small group of 81 that had nearly no abnormalities present, and then also a group that had um, a fairly mixed uh, grouping of different abnormalities. However, they were all fairly benign in nature. And so ultimately, we decided we would group together these two um, clusters um, to serve as our reference group in order to increase the sample size for the reference. Um, I will also briefly point out, um, although I will mention in um, sensitivity analysis, we did keep these separate using, I believe, the mixed group as our reference group, and it didn't substantially change our, our interpretation of the findings. Um, so there are two additional groups I'd like to briefly mention. So for this algorithm, um, you can't have an individual have all zeros or all ones for all of the features and be included. There needs to be some degree of variability. So those that had no abnormalities, which were 15 individuals, ended up being excluded from the initial creation of these clusters. And then also, um, the algorithm itself doesn't allow for missing data. So we had 71% of individuals that had 
or sorry, not 71 percent, 71 individuals, <laughs> just a small number, that were missing data on at least one feature. Um, so we did initially exclude these individuals as opposed to try to impute those values. However, most of these had only one feature missing. And when we looked at the data, their, their patterns were actually quite similar to this mixed group. So ultimately, for our main analysis, we ended up putting back in these individuals that we excluded and putting them in our reference group. However, in sensitivity analyses, we did exclude them and again found that um, in their inclusion or exclusion didn't seem much to make much of a difference for our final interpretations. Um, so this visual here is uh, kind of a busy, but I just want to highlight a couple of things. So um, this list is the most frequent um, features of the placentas that were in these given clusters. And here we see the percent um, within a given cluster that had that particular feature. So for our severe vascular malperfusion cluster, you can see that nearly all of them had retroplacental bleeding with hemorrhage and also nearly all had microscopic abruption present. Um, and this was in stark contrast to the other clusters where very, very few of them had these particular features. For our fetal vascular malperfusion cluster, um, you may not be familiar with all of these um, placental features, but they tend to indicate um, signs of chronic hypoxia um, and uh, impeded blood flow to the fetus during um, during the pregnancy. And so this was a main reason why we um, labeled this group as fetal vascular malperfusion. And our other vascular malperfusion group um, tended to have some similar uh, uh, features as the fetal vascular and um, maternal vascular group. However, they tended to occur slightly um, less frequently. And then for our two inflammation clusters, um, the most common features were the presence of meconium and signs of infection and inflammation. Um, this table provides the percentage of adverse outcomes occurring within each cluster, and we observed within the severe maternal vascular malperfusion cluster, um, they uh, had a higher percentage of preterm birth, nearly 22%, and 8.6 resulted in stillbirth, which is really quite high. Um, and this is in contrast to our normal cluster, where only 11% were preterm and 0.7% resulted in stillbirth. Um, looking at our growth outcomes, we observed that the fetal vascular malperfusion cluster um, most frequently had um, small uh, for gestational age births and small head circumferences. However, across all of our abnormal clusters, we observed that these outcomes occurred at a higher frequency than among our normal cluster. And then lastly, for preeclampsia, 5% um, of the fetal vascular malperfusion cluster had preeclampsia, um, although it was also slightly elevated in our severe maternal vascular malperfusion cluster. Um, so those results are, we expressed as crude relative risks up in this top portion of the table here, um, but the same patterns, of course, are present. Um, when we adjusted for our measured um, common risk factors in the table below, we observed that most of the associations tended to move in a downward direction. However, several of them still remained elevated, like preterm birth among the severe maternal vascular malperfusion cluster and our growth outcomes among our, most of our abnormal clusters. And so to us, this indicated that while some risk factors have been identified, there's still much more um, work to be done to identify what's causing these placental abnormalities and their consequences. Um, and then interestingly for preeclampsia, upon adjustment, these associations actually tended to become stronger. Um, this seems to be in part uh, explained by the fact that some risk factors for preeclampsia were actually more common among our normal cluster, um, like obesity and um, not smoking during the pregnancy. And so um, uh, that's partially why these associations do appear stronger in the adjusted models. Um, and then the last thing I'd like to point out is that um, we were pretty surprised by the fact that uh, for our fetal vascular malperfusion cluster and in inflammation too, we saw lower risk of preterm birth 
compared to our normal group. Um, honestly, this highlights the fact that this is a statistical grouping uh, procedure and is not a clinical definition. Um, these findings may be just due to chance or an artifact in this particular data set, given that this is a highly data-driven method. So that takes me to the end of both of the studies, um, just to highlight a few limitations of both. So these analyses are fairly exploratory in nature, um, particularly for this second study, we had some small number issues, especially for stillbirth and preeclampsia. Um, we're limited by the data that we have at hand, and so we don't have data on all possible risk factors that we could um, evaluate for both of these questions. Um, and there's still potential for epidemiologic biases to creep in and affect the results of um, these machine learning algorithms, such as misclassification of the input data and selection bias. Um, and these are areas I actually am really interested if, um, if it's possible to look into a little bit more, um, just because these methods really are being used now increasingly so much and um it seems like these particular biases may be often overlooked in terms of their potential influence on the results um also um, reproducibility especially for for um the cluster method could potentially be problematic because we only analyzed the results in our individual data um and so whether or not these findings actually translate to other data we don't know yet um, and that also kind of corresponds with the generalizability issue, which I particularly noted for the safe passage results, given that um, those populations were selected for a particular research question that differed from the one that we looked at. Um, so just some closing thoughts. Um, I do think that machine learning has potential to move our field forward. Um, however, Maybe in a way it's kind of reassuring to some to see that some of the results that we found were not entirely different from what we would expect. Um, it shows that maybe we haven't been doing everything entirely wrong to begin with. Um, also, just through my experience working with these algorithms, I mean, I uh, only gave a very brief presentation on all the different iterations that we ran. And um, these things can be pretty sensitive to the way you parameterize them. Um, I'm increasingly appreciating that even the seed you set for some of these when it's doing these random selections, that initial starting seed can matter for some analyses. Um, and just seeing some work that's been uh, that's being published out there, um, there are some findings that people don't seem to be able to clearly explain um, why they're seeing what they're seeing. So, I think that there is an opportunity as we continue to use these in EPI to um, not try to um, just look at these methods in isolation, but also compare the results to more conventional methods that uh, maybe are a little bit more tangible and less black box to try to understand um, why we may be getting something different from the machine learning algorithms. So. Ultimately, I think this is going to be a collaborative effort between those that have the computer science and the statistical background and also the subject matter experts to come up with the models, but also be able to understand the context and the problems with the initial data to begin with and be able to interpret the findings in a really thoughtful way. And so I'll close us out with um, this quote that I really like, um, but it makes me think of this particular situation that we're in, where at this point, we probably a lot of the questions we're trying to address in terms of etiology are really high hanging fruit. They're not easily within our grasp, hence why we haven't been able to figure them out yet. But in order for us to approach this in a strategic fashion, we really need to kind of build upon the knowledge that we already have um try to use these new approaches um in a in a careful and thoughtful way and not just try to get all of the things we can potentially get out of them because ultimately they may end up producing uh, some more confusion and potentially garbage um so i don't think we've been doing everything wrong so far and we just need to be really careful because um, these are powerful tools but they're not it's not very easy to see all the time time why you're getting the results that you are getting. Um, 
So that takes me to the end of my talk. Um, I'd like to thank my co-authors on these two particular works of no um, Dr. Werler, who was my dissertation chair. Um, also, of course, the study participants involved in both of these studies and the groups of PIs that helped oversee the projects, the pathologists involved in safe passage. And here I also acknowledge um, the various funding sources, which were many for both of these uh, original uh, data collection efforts. And with that, I thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>